Well, it's good to see you all again today. Um, today, the, the topic is sola fides, justification by faith alone. I'll remind us that we don't have a formal debate. This is both sides articulating and defending their positions. We don't have a resolution formally pro and con. The format, moreover, is pretty much the same as yesterday. Opening statements, a break, cross-examination, rebuttal, then an open forum for questions. The singular difference is that there'll be concluding remarks of 15 minutes at the end to summarize both days. So without further ado, let me introduce the Roman Catholic opening statement. The order will be reversed in fairness today. And Bill Marshner is up first. Well, good morning, everyone. I think we've, I think we've come to the moment that our sponsoring organization has been waiting for. Because I think they're going to want to argue this morning that on account of believing in some ghastly Pelagian or semi-Pelagian works righteousness, we Catholics have lost the key to salvation and on that ground cannot be accounted either a Christian church or perhaps even Christians individually. Our task is to convince you, perhaps very much against your anticipation, that we don't teach any such thing, never have, and by the grace of God, never will. We begin with the question, what is sola fide? Because this part is labeled our critique of sola fide. Well, what our critique is depends on what sola fide is. Is it Ephesians chapter 2, the familiar verses 8 to 10? For by grace are ye saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Is that what sola fide is? If it is, I may as well sit down because we don't have a critique of it. It's true. Now, of course, the full doctrine of justification doesn't consist only of that one verse of sacred scripture. There are many theses that are involved in this doctrine. But let me tick off some on which we agree. So they won't be in contention here this morning, I hope. And I invite you to check for yourself that what I'm about to say is in the Tridentine Decree on Justification. That text is not hard to get hold of. It's been in English for years and years and years. I have it here in Latin this morning. There's a copy over there in English. You'll probably get it in many bookstores. Read that document for yourself. And you will see that we agree, first of all, that the faith by which we are justified is a gift in us of God's grace. Not only is justifying faith a gift in us, but all motions and changes and preparations in man preliminary to that wonderful moment in which we believe the promises of God and receive Christ as our Savior, all those preparations, too, are gifts of God's grace in us. Without that grace, we could not move or prepare ourselves in any way towards justification. We agree about that. Second, we agree that this gift is given to us on no other basis than the merits of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose again for our justification. The gift of faith, any preceding gift and any following gift, all good works which are the working out of faith, 
are in us, made possible in us, granted to us on no other basis than the finished work of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose again for our justification. We agree about that. Thirdly, this faith which justifies is one that works through love. As St. Paul says in the Epistle to the Galatians, it is a faith that works. And it works through love. And because a loving faith is disposed to believe what is presented to us by God as true, to accept it as true, and is at the same time disposed to trust what God gives to us as a promise, and at the same time is disposed to obey what God gives to us as an instruction or a command, this faith is one that is necessarily connected to good works and to sanctification. I was greatly edified when I um, happened upon the definition of saving faith in the Westminster Catechism. I had written a footnote of my own propounding this view and uh, didn't know that the Westminster Confession said the same thing and so I was utterly delighted to find that my own wretched footnote had been anticipated in that wonderful 17th century prose. Hmm. By this faith a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein and acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. And in addition to that, it says, the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for all these things that we trust God to deliver to us. Justification, sanctification, eternal life. So we agree about that. That's what saving faith is like. I hope we all agree about that. I'm not sure about the Lutherans. Are there any Lutherans here this morning? Can I see a show of hands? Have we got any Lutherans? I don't see too many hands. Oh, I see a few. All right, good. I want you people to remember that this could very well be a three-sided debate, okay? Because if our Lutheran over here does his job and stands up for the universality of the atonement and the resistibility of grace, it's going to be a very different debate than if he knuckles in on these things to his Calvinist colleagues. Number four, here's something else we agree on. I've been through three points, I think, yeah, three. Here's the fourth thing we agree about. Since sanctification is part of our salvation and good works are involved in what God does in you when he sanctifies you, good works are necessary parts of our salvation. That's why St. Paul says, as Jesus says, that... It's on this basis that we are judged. So they are involved in an intrinsic way in our salvation. Some people are very surprised when they hear that there's a res that, that this is Protestant doctrine. Well, it's certainly Reformed doctrine. In the Lutheran church I grew up in, I think that if I had uh, stood up in my youth and said, uh, you know... Since sanctification is part of our salvation, good works are necessary parts of our salvation, I might have been stoned. Anyway, I think I would have been disagreed with 
or looked down upon as a crypto-Catholic. But anyway, that is certainly the Reformed teaching, as I am happy to see. So we agree about that. And I think there's a fifth point we, about, we agree about, too. These good works are never the ground on which we are saved. These good works are part of what God accomplishes in, in us, in saving us. But they, again, I hope we agree on this, are not the ground on which we are saved because from the first moment we believe to the last moment we persevere the sole ground of our salvation is the cross of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose again for our justification that's why St. Paul says in that famous passage in Ephesians he doesn't just say, by grace are ye justified, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. He doesn't use the verb justified there. He uses the word saved. From the beginning to the end, to the very end of our perseverance, we are founded, resting on, that finished work of Christ. And yet, one more point. That I think we agree on, but I'm going to have to word this carefully. Even though God is utterly trustworthy to keep his promise, that if we believe in him we shall be saved, and we do believe in him, Nevertheless, we cannot draw the inference for ourselves that I am with absolute certitude saved, one of the elect, and so on, as a matter of divine faith. Now, I have to throw that last part in. That's a crucial qualifier in Trent. There was a big debate at the Council of Trent over what kind of assurance we could have. There was a minimalist view that said we could have a well-founded conjecture and no good reason to doubt it. There was a stronger view, <clears throat> defended by Catharinus, that we could have a true inward certitude of the Holy Spirit the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That view, too, was defended at Trent. Trent condemned neither view. And, um, <laughs> condemned, well, tolerated both views, and only condemned the view that we are entitled to draw an inference to our own personal election or justification as a matter of dogma as though it became part of divine public revelation as though we knew ourselves to be saved on the same kind of faith on which we know Christ to be our Savior that's the thing at Trent well I'm already over time those are the points on which we just on which we all agree where then does the disagreement come the disagreement comes in the effort of Reformation dogmatics to separate justification from sanctification as two realities, as two different things rather than as two ways of looking at or two aspects of the same thing. That one thing being the gift of God in us which begins with our faith. If justification and sanctification are just two aspects, if they're simultaneous, then any quarrel between us is nitpicking. But if they are separate realities, all right, 
And justification is somehow so distinct from sanctification that any reckoning of the works which are faith working through love to justification is wrong, then perhaps we have an appearance of a difficulty. How real it will be will come out in what is to come. We now move to show that in the scriptures, justification, filial adoption as children of God, and our sanctification are so intimately tied together that from the point of view of the divine scriptures, they ought not be arbitrarily or excessively pried apart. Thank you very much. In the Council of Trent, it says, because faith is the beginning of human salvation, the foundation and root of all justification, without which it is impossible to please God and to come to the fellowship of his sons. And we are therefore said to be justified gratuitously because none of those things that precede justification, whether faith or works, merit the grace of justification. For if, it, if by grace... It is not now by works. Otherwise, as the Apostle says, grace is no more grace. I entitle my opening here is Sola Fide Bona Fide. In Revelation 22, 18 and 19, it says that we should not add or take away from the prophecy of this book. We saw last night that to help prove his doctrine of justification, Martin Luther took away from the scripture by declaring that he should throw Jimmy into the stove. This is not Jiminy Cricket, by the way. This is the very word of God, the epistle of James. What a legacy for Lutherans to bring to a debate on sola fide, let alone sola scriptura. But that's not all that Martin Luther did. He not only took away from God's word, he also added to God's word. In violation again of Revelation 22.18, Luther did this by inserting the word alone into his translation of Romans 3.28 and Galatians 2.16 so that it would read that we are justified by faith alone. And a slight paraphrase of Luther's comments on this. He says, if the papists make a fuss over my addition and ask by what authority this is done, you tell them Dr. Luther said it should be so. The papists are nothing but asses. The only time the word alone is used in reference to justification in the New Testament is in James where it says we are not saved by faith alone. The only time the word alone is ever used in reference to justification. James 2.24 I'm sure our opponents last night were tempted, like Luther, to insert the word alone in 2 Timothy 3.16 so that it would read, Scripture alone is inspired and profitable for teaching. But though they may not be so bold as Luther to add the word alone to the actual text of the Bible, nevertheless, they teach the same thing. But we will see this morning that the Bible does not teach justification by faith alone, but that faith necessarily includes its own self-defining works, and that without these works there is no faith Thus, faith is not alone. You will hear our opponents say something to this effect. We are saved by grace through faith alone, but by a faith that is not alone. This is a silly confusion of words, a theological doublespeak, a talking out of both sides of one's theological mouth. Either faith is alone without works, or it is not alone. You cannot have your faith alone cake and eat it too. This was the contention between Lutherans and Calvinists. Luther said, faith alone without works. Calvin modified this and talked about faith working through love. In one of his last commentaries on faith and works, John Calvin in his commentary on Ezekiel, shortly before his death in 1564, wrote this. For this proposition that faith without works justifies is true, yet false. 
according to the different senses which it bears. The proposition that faith without works justifies by itself is false because faith without works is void. He who is born of God is, quote, just, as John says in 1 John 5.15. That's a long way from what Martin Luther said. As a matter of fact, this stance of Calvin raised accusation from Lutherans that they were denying sola fide. Sola Scriptura sure has not helped the Calvinist and Lutheran camps very much. While at my studies at Westminster Theological Seminary in the early 1980s, echoes of Catholic teaching were bombarding the seminary when Professor Norman Shepard said that works were necessary for justification. This divided the seminary right down the middle. Professors I had admired were now opposing each other in a bitter, bitter dispute in what I would call, for lack of a better term, a heresy trial, which took place for Mr. Shepard. It was interesting to note that support for Shepard was being drawn from such prominent Reformed theologians as Bavink and Calvin. Bavink saying almost the same thing that Calvin did, saying that faith is not alone in every respect in relation to works. Just what other problems are there for the faith alone position? I'd like to make about five or six points along those lines. You have that watch. If works play no part in our salvation, why are works the very things that are judged at the end of time to determine our salvation and our rewards or lack thereof? For example, 2 Corinthians 5.10, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for our good or bad deeds done in the body. Romans 14, 10 through 12, the same language. Matthew 12, 36 to 37, For every idle word men shall give a, they shall give account of in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. By the way, that word justified is the same word that Paul uses, dikaio. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 17, If any man build with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If it survives, he shall receive a reward. If it is burned, he will suffer loss, but shall be saved through fire. If any man shall destroy God's temple, God shall destroy him. More verses. Matthew 16, 27, Romans 2, 6, and 8, John 5, 28, and 29, Revelation 22, 12, 1 Corinthians 4, 4. I can go through the whole New Testament. As a matter of fact, there is not a book in the whole New Testament, with a possible exception of Philemon, that does not in some way or other suspend the results of our eternal destination upon the presence or absence of obedience. My Protestant brethren will claim that the works talked about, for example, the works in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, are works that are for rewards only. They have nothing to do with salvation. These works are not sins. I ask, pray tell, where does the Bible separate bad works from sins? There is no verse in the Bible that does that. These works are sins that are being judged. Look at the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. These people are in bitter dispute. I am of Apollos. I am of Christ. Paul says, for your jealousy and quarreling, these things that come upon you, you are carnal men. This is sin. This is not some judicially neutral actions on their part. In Romans 14, we have the same thing. Not loving the brethren. Making a brother stumble. These are sins. These are not some little petty crimes that are going to be slapped on the wrist at Judgment Day. That's the context that Paul talks about. The next point I'd like to make is the concept of juridical justification at the initial point of justification has no biblical contextual support. The only thing close to a courtroom scene for salvation is at the end of time when Christ stands as the judge of all. The biblical context of initial justification has, as its New Testament background, a relational, familial context. Though it is granted that words for righteousness or justification can etymologically be shown to have some juridical basis, this is primarily in the Old Testament legal theocracy, and even then, 85 to 90 percent of these uses are moral, not juridical. The main question is, what does faith have to do with jurisprudence? The answer is nothing. But it has everything to do with relationships. 
The words legal, forensic, contract, verdict, acquitted, defendant, court, courtroom, lawyer, juridical, jury, judge do not appear in reference to our initial justification with God in the New Testament. When the New Testament is describing justification or salvation, it never uses a courtroom scene. It uses many other paradigms, but not a courtroom. Instead, Abraham is called the friend of God when he's justified, not the acquitted defendant. There is the enemy friend paradigm, Romans 5, 9, and James 2, 23. There is the marriage widowhood paradigm, Romans 7, 1 to 4. There is the bondwoman free woman paradigm, Galatians 4, 21 and following. There is the legitimate illegitimate son paradigm, Hebrews 12. There is the Jew Gentile paradigm, Galatians 2, Ephesians 3. And finally, there is the adoption paradigm, Romans 8, 15 and 23, Romans 9, 4, Galatians 4, 5, and Ephesians 1, 5. Point three, justification is infused righteousness, not merely a legal declaration of not guilty. This is the sticky point between us. There are passages, many passages I could point to to point this out, but one that stands out in particular is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 where Paul says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. The lexicons of Bauer, Walter Bauer, and Art and Gingrich say that dikaio here, the word justified, is causative. That is to make one pure. Not to label one pure, to make one pure. That's the Catholic position. The context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is clearly one of Christian living. What they used to do, they no longer do. Paul, in other words, could not be saying, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were juridically declared not guilty, because it would not fit in the context. Point four. So what does Paul mean then in Romans 3.28 when he says, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law? Saved by faith and not works of the law simply means that we shall prove that one cannot blindly or proudly obey the Mosaic law to make himself right with God. Rather, he must have an intimate relationship with God exercised by strong belief, that is faith, a strong perseverance, that is hope, and a strong desire, that is love. The law cannot save because, number one, the law exposes sin, Romans 3.20. Number two, the law requires faultless obedience, which no one can do being in sin, Galatians 3.10. Instead, the law of the Spirit must preside in the individual, Romans 7.6, Romans 8.11. One cannot base his relationship to God on a written code without the heart being involved, Romans 2.29, Romans 7.6, Colossians 2.13 and 14. Works that are done for justification go above and beyond the written code of law. Yet some are included within the written code. Abraham and Rahab, prime examples of justification, did things that were not specifically required by the Decalogue, but they did the summary of the Decalogue. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look at Paul's emphasis on boasting. The pride boasting of the works of the law. Ephesians 2.8, the very verse that is used by our opponents, saved by grace through faith, not by works so that no one can boast. Romans 2.17, a Jew, you rely on the law and boast. Romans 2.23, you boast about the law, but break the law. Romans 3.27, where then is boasting? It is excluded. The difference between proud, heartless, stick it in God's face, law keeping, and the obedience from the inner heart has been changed by the Spirit of God. In Luke 16, 15, Jesus says, You justify yourselves before men. The same word, dikaio. You justify yourselves before men by your proud law keeping to show how good you are. But God knows your hearts. Luke 18, verse 9. To those confident of their own righteousness and who look down on everyone else, Jesus told the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. And the Pharisee is saying, I tithe, I fast twice a week. I do all these good things. Look how good I am, God. Stick it in your face, God. 
And then the publican is over there beating his breast and won't even look up to heaven and says, I am a sinner. That is the man who was justified, dikaio, Jesus said, not the proud lawkeeper. <clears throat> the works of the law refer, in the first place, to the ceremonial law. Romans 2.29, Paul says, No a man is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Get away from your circumcision. Don't live by that written code. Live by the Spirit. But the works of the law also refer to the moral law that they were so proud to keep. In Romans 7, 6, it says, We have been released from the law so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And then he goes on to talk about the law of coveting, which is a moral part of the Decalogue, not a ceremonial law. Both of these, Paul says, are the written code that will not justify you before God. Why? Because they are not dealing with the Spirit inside your heart. The law of the Spirit intersects the written code, but it supersedes it and is independent of it. For example, Jesus' command, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is a law of the Spirit that intersects with a command like do not steal of the Decalogue, but it must come from the heart. If I do something for you out of a legal arrangement, you have an obligation to do something for me. But if I do it on a relational basis, not expecting anything in return, you have no obligation. There is no written code. But if you return the favor out of the goodness of your heart, it is done purely out of love, faith working in love. One should not be prompted to do things from the written code, but from love. What kind of faith did Paul want from the Jews? In Habakkuk 2.4, which is quoted three times in the New Testament, it says, The just shall live by faith. This should be translated, The just shall live by his faithfulness, because everywhere else this Hebrew word is used, it is translated as faithfulness. But how else does Habakkuk describe this? In verse 4 he says, See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous shall live by his faith. What is he contrasting? The puffed upness of this man. Not moral obedience to the law. That's what God wants. He doesn't want the puffed upness. He wants faith. Humble faith. In the New Testament, three times Paul says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any value. What counts? Faith working through love, Galatians 5, 6. A new creation, Galatians 6.15, and keeping God's commandments, 1 Corinthians 7.19, all preface by this circumcision-uncircumcision contrast. They're all the same thing. Faith working through love, then, is keeping God's commandments. Faith working through love is the new creation, the new spirit I just talked about, that must reside in our heart to perform for God. Didn't Deuteronomy 7.9 say, to those who love me and keep my commandments... We cannot stick the menstrual rags of my own self-righteousness in God's face and expect merit. But works of obedience done from a humble and contrite heart which God rewards based on grace, not by obligation, is what the scripture teaches. The terms justification, sanctification, regeneration, baptism, repentance, obedience, faith, love, can all be used distinctively in various places in the New Testament. But for the most part, they are interchangeable terms which describe our humble and intimate relationship with God, our Creator. There is a fluidity of thought in reference to these terms as used by the Old and New Testaments. We see this dramatically in two case studies. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. Turn in there in your Bibles and look at this amazing passage. Acts chapter 10, verse 2. Cornelius is a Gentile. A Gentile on the order of Romans 2, who's seeking after God. His works please God before his justification. But let me preface it by saying, these works are all done by God's grace, of course. But these were not stick it in your face self-righteous, legalistic works characteristic of the Jews. But what does it say in verse 2? His works of almsgiving, prayer, devotion, 
and fear of God were what God recognized. Verse 22 calls him a righteous man. Verse 35 says he fears God and does what is right, and this is how God is going to judge every man. In verse 4 and 31, God responds to his prayers and his works of giving to the poor by sending an angel to him. Finally, in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 14, he is going to be brought the message of salvation. Then he's baptized and made part of the church. But do you see how fluid this whole thing is? How he's devoted to God before he ever even hears the message of salvation? How did he know how to do this? Because God wrote it on his heart. We will learn from our opponents tonight that that passage in Romans 2 is hypothetical. This doesn't happen, they tell us. But it happens here with Cornelius. Let's take the case of Abraham. The fluidity of justification in Abraham's life is very apparent. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham left Haran. And that refers to Genesis 12. In Hebrews 11, verse 11, it says, By faith Abraham believed God was going to give 90-year-old Sarah a child. That refers to Genesis 15. In Hebrews 11:17, it says, By faith Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. That refers to Genesis 22. Now, we have three different instances of Abraham's faith. Two of those instances, Abraham is said to be justified. One, by Paul in Romans 4, says Abraham was justified by faith, not works. And also in James, he says, he quotes the same verse. And says, he justified by works. And then he adds, Genesis 22, where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. Now, the question is, what about Genesis 12? Didn't the Hebrew writer just tell us that Abraham had faith in Genesis 12? Before he was supposedly justified at a point in time, as we are told by the Protestants in Genesis 15? Is it not the same saving faith that he had in Genesis 15? Yes, that's what the Hebrew writer tells us. You see, Abraham was justified at three different points. Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 22. Why is this a problem for the reform position? The reform position holds that regeneration is what makes us have faith. So if Abraham has faith in Genesis 12, then he was regenerated. If he's regenerated, that necessitates justification. If he was justified in Genesis 12, then he was not justified initially in Genesis 15. It is not a point in time declarative act. It is a fluidity of justification as seen throughout the Old and New Testament. I have two minutes left, and I've gone through most of the material, and there's many more things I could cover. But I would just like to say, I appreciate what Bill has done in showing the similarities in our two positions. But there are major differences. The whole tone of this debate has been to show the differences between our two faiths. Because there is an ecumenical movement out there that is trying to bring us together. That we may not want to be together just yet until we iron out these difficulties. But I ask you to pay attention to these points that I have made. Number one, that we are judged for our works at the end of time. Number two, that there is no courtroom language in the New Testament. Number three, that the Bible talks about infused righteousness. Number four, that there is a fluidity of terminology in reference to justification, especially in the cases of Cornelius and Abraham, the two prime examples. Abraham probably the prime example. That is our case. And that's the way I'll leave it. Referring to the schism of the 14th and 15th centuries, one scholar observes, For nearly half a century, the church was split into two or three obediences that excommunicated one another, so that every Catholic lived under excommunication by one pope or another, and in the last analysis, no one could say with certainty which of the contenders had right on his side. The church no longer offered certainty of salvation. She had become questionable in her whole objective form. The true church, the true pledge of salvation, had to be sought outside the institution. 
It is against this backdrop, the scholar goes on, I'm, this is all a quote, of a profoundly shaken ecclesial consciousness that we are to understand that Luther, in the conflict between his search for salvation and the tradition of the church, ultimately came to experience the church, not as the guarantor, but as the adversary of salvation." End quote. I do hope the credibility of this historical assessment won't be called into question as it comes to us from the pen of Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, the current head of the Sacred Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith for the Church of Rome. As the gavel came down to close the final session of the Council of Trent in 1563, Rome had officially, and according to her own commitment down to the present moment, irreversibly declared that the gospel announced by the prophets, revealed in and by Christ, and proclaimed by the apostles was actually heretical. The most relevant canons are the following. Canon 9. If anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, let him be anathema. Canon 11. If anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the righteousness of Christ or by the sole remission of sins, let him be anathema. Canon 12. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that it is this confidence alone that justifies, let him be anathema. Canon 24. If anyone says that the righteousness received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of the increase, let him be anathema. Canon 30. If anyone says that after the reception of the grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted and the debt of eternal punishment so blotted out to every repentant sinner that no debt of temporal punishment remains to be discharged either in this world or in purgatory before the gates of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema. Canon 32. If anyone says that the good works of the one justified are in such manner the gifts of God that they are not also the good merits of him justified or that the one justified by the good works that he performs by the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ does not truly merit an increase of grace and eternal life. Let him be anathema. It was therefore not the evangelicals who were condemned in 1564, but the evangel. The good news, which alone is the power of God unto salvation, was judged by Rome to be so erroneous that anyone who embraced it was to be regarded as under the ban of the church. Let us now consider the key questions and passages relating to this precious doctrine. First of all, what is justification? Is it infusion, as we have heard? Is it a process or is it imputation and a declaration in a legal sense? In the Roman system, as we've seen, justification is sanctification through baptism, we are renewed and by cooperating with grace infused, we merit our final justification. Nothing uh, can merit one's first justification, they will tell you, but one must merit its increase and eternal life. Long and short of this was that on the eve of the Reformation itself, there were many different interpretations of this doctrine, but the decisive moment occurred not with Luther, but with the Roman Catholic humanist Erasmus, to whose criticism of the Latin text uh, we could refer at length. The Latin Vulgate, Jerome's 4th century translation of the scriptures, had been the official translation throughout the Middle Ages, and its integrity was generally assumed. But then came the Renaissance, a recovery of, uh, a dis recovery of classical learning that included a return to the original Greek text of scripture. As Oxford theologian Alistair McGrath observes, the best examples of the errors in the Latin Vulgate, corrected in the tail end of the Renaissance, not in the Reformation, but the Renaissance before it, concerns its translation of the Greek word dikaiosune, which means to declare righteous. It is a legal term, a verdict, but the Latin Vulgate had translated dikaiosune with a Latin word justificare, which means to make righteous. Erasmus and a host of classical scholars recognized that the Greek text required an understanding of justification that referred to a change in status rather than to a change in behavior or mode of being. It's quite remarkable that the Roman church would continue to embrace its erroneous view of justification given the advances in scholarship by their own best minds. This is not only true of the 16th century, many Roman Catholic biblical scholars of our own day recognize that the Roman position is untenable in the light of the biblical text. And I'm not just talking about Hans Kuhn, 
but to the accepted interpretations of Roman doctrine. Bearing the Neil Obstadt and imprimatur of the Roman Church, Sacramentum Mundi is a modern encyclopedia of Roman doctrine. In its article on justification, we read the following. Justification implies a relation with a judgment rather than a mode of being. The term for Paul always has a forensic flavor, legal, judicial. What we were told doesn't exist in the New Testament which prevents it becoming a mere synonym of regeneration or renewal. In later theology, however, this sense is often lost, and justification comes to mean nothing more than the infusion of grace. Now when St. Paul, I'm still quoting Sacramento Mundi, when St. Paul applies the juridical terminology to the new Christian reality, it acquires an entirely new meaning. It refers not to the future, but to the past. Denied by the Council of Trent, Romans 5, 9. He even has it here in the text. Not to the just man, but to the sinner. That's our argument, Romans 4, 5. And so the basis of justification must also be different. It can no longer be observance of law. It must be Christ, whom God has made our righteousness and sanctification and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1, 30, which is the same thing as saying that we are justified by faith in Christ, Romans 3, 28, end quote. Furthermore, arguably the two most widely respected Roman Catholic biblical scholars, J.A. Fitzmaier and Raymond Brown, have recognized that justification is understood in the biblical text to mean legal acquittal and not a process of growth in inherent righteousness. Quote, justification in the Old Testament, writes Fitzmaier, denotes one who stood acquitted or vindicated before a judge's tribunal. This uprightness, righteousness, does not belong to human beings and is not something that they produced or merited. It is an alien righteousness. Sounds like Luther. One belonging to another, Christ, and attributed to them because of what that other had done for them. This justification comes about by grace and through faith." End quote. But we can go a step beyond Sacramento Mundi and Fitzmaier and Brown citing an article that our opponents will no doubt respect since it's published in their own magazine, This Rock. After attacking the Protestant doctrine of faith alone, Leslie Rumble concedes, quote, Now it is quite true that Paul made use of a word which, in the Greek language, had the technical meaning of legal acquittal. And if the word can have no other meaning than that, one would scarcely dispute the interpretation of justification as implying no more than to be counted as righteous or not guilty in the sight of God. But alas, says Rumble, Luther had not the advantages of modern scholarship. He belonged to an age when it was thought that the real meaning of the New Testament could be best ascertained by discovering the exact sense of the Greek language in which the books were originally written. Shame on him! Rumble evidently thinks that the meaning of the biblical text can't be discerned, discerned in the same manner as scholars are always discerning the meaning of Homer and Aristotle. Having conceded that the New Testament Greek text agrees with Luther, Rumble nevertheless rejects this view on the basis that the whole religious outlook takes precedence over the fine print. Although he admits that this interpretation is at odds with the scriptures in their original languages, we are supposed to take Rumble's word for it. It's just assumption, dicta, that the whole religious outlook of the Bible endorses the Roman position even though the actual words of the Bible contradict it. The verbal ending of Dikaiao is declarative. If the biblical writers intended by justification a process of moral transformation, there's a perfectly good verbal ending for it. Adzo rather than ao. For instance, to make holy. Hagiadzo. And this word is never rendered to justify. Furthermore, it's an imputation of an alien righteousness rather than an infusion of righteousness into the soul. It is not, as it has been caricatured, a legal fiction, as if God could judge contrary to the facts. We maintain that God's judgment is strictly according to the facts, but that it is Christ's righteousness imputed to our account that allows God to be both just and justifier of those who believe. It is not a legal fiction because Christ's righteousness is real and perfect, and it has been truly credited to the account of the believing sinner. If you transfer funds to my bank account, which I hope you all might think about, Although I did not earn it, it is my treasure. Is that a banking fiction? 
Luther's phrase was simuliusis et peccator, simultaneously justified and sinful. God judges a believing sinner righteous, not because the individual is actually righteous, but because he is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Now, our opponents will argue that there is no single text that explicitly bears the words justification by faith alone. Of course, they're right, but I'm certain that they would argue that it would be rather simplistic to suggest the scriptures don't teach the doctrine of the Trinity simply because the word isn't there. The scriptures are hardly ambiguous in excluding all human activity from being the instrument of justification, with the exception of faith. Is this not to say faith alone? Let me run through some of the biblical passages at this point. The gospel is announced first in Genesis after the fall, where God finds Adam and Eve in their guilt and self-righteousness. Their fig leaves cannot hide their shame from God, but the Redeemer God sacrifices an animal and clothes them in its skins, anticipating the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Already the gospel is announced, not as divine assistance in producing an inherent righteousness, but as God's covering the believer with the righteousness of a sacrificial lamb. It is external to the believing sinner. In God's covenant with Abraham, Genesis 15, we learn that, again, sinners can only be justified through faith in God's gracious promise. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. In Habakkuk 2.4, we read that while the unbelievers are puffed up with their own righteousness, the believer, by his faith, shall live. The impossibility of being justified by an inherent righteousness, that is, by works, runs throughout Scripture. As the writer to the Hebrews insists, in Hebrews 11, all of the great Old Testament saints were justified by faith, not by their own deeds. Scriptures declare even our best works are filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6, and the psalmist declares, no one living is righteous before you. So our only hope is Psalm 103, 10, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. In his earthly ministry, therefore, our Lord was regularly confronting the religious leaders with their confidence in their own piety. While he offered the gospel to prostitutes who knew their sinfulness, he offered the law first to those who did not. He came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, and he held that law up to the self-righteous Pharisees as the standard of divine perfection. For I tell you, said Jesus, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now he didn't say, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the prostitutes, which we could all understand. Surely I'm not like a prostitute, we reason. That's not what Jesus said. How could a fisherman, a vulgar fisherman like Peter, possibly live up to that? Well, the Apostle Paul answered the question in Philippians 3. He says, if anyone had any reason to boast about his own inherent righteousness, it was he circumcised on the eighth day an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness of the law, blameless. And what's Paul's response? Whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. I regard these as dung in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness infused. Not having a righteousness of my own. That comes from law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, not from me, from God, based on faith. Philippians 3, 5 through 9. This is why Jesus threatened the religious leaders with the law itself, although they thought that their inherent righteousness, their obedience to God's commands, their piety, their devotion, was justifying them before God, they could only maintain this charade so long as they didn't really know the law. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells them what the law really means. You are a murderer if you hate your neighbor. You are an adulterer, not in the act, but in the lust, in the desire for it. The young Pharisee who thought he had fulfilled the law since he was a child was told by Jesus to sell everything he had to give it to the poor. Do you really love your neighbor? Really? You've done this since you're okay? Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He left sad. Who then can be saved? The disciples asked. Jesus replied, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. 
Echoing the words of Christ here, St. Anselm in the 11th century wisely counseled, you have not yet considered how great your sin is. And to those who trust in their own piety, their own inherent righteousness, their own process of justification, the realization of God's purity sends them away sad, angry, or perhaps more determined to try even harder to attain righteousness by their own works. Some, however, like the disciples, will relinquish their own works and, like Paul, place them in the debit rather than the credit column, and their despair will turn to joy in the all-sufficient merit of Christ. Jesus taught justification by faith alone throughout his entire earthly ministry. First he would preach the law, bringing people to despair, and then he would preach the gospel. Friend, your sins are forgiven. When he saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. In the presence of the Pharisees, Jesus forgave a prostitute, telling her, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In Luke 18, 9, we find another one of the situations which has already been brought up. We read, To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a day and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. First, the parable is told, says Luke, to some who are confident in their own righteousness. Now, to the extent that Rome even speaks of meriting justification, de congruo or de condino, in any sense, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Pharisee in this parable and our friends in this debate. But our friends will protest. We attribute our inherent righteousness to God. It is his work in us. It's grace in us. But the Pharisee, too, thanked God for this inherent righteousness, didn't he? I thank you, God, that I am not like he. He pointed to his own spiritual disciplines, fasting, tithing, and so on. But he thanked God for it all. But it meant absolutely nothing as Jesus sets his example beside that of a notorious sinner who didn't even have time to do penance. Jesus concludes, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. In his high priestly prayer with the crucifixion just over the horizon, Jesus prayed concerning his people, For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. He fulfilled all righteousness, not to save himself, but to save us. So we're told in John's writings, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. So that you may know you have eternal life. That is called in Roman Catholic theology the sin of presumption. And Jesus stated, very truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, all these legal words that aren't supposed to be in the New Testament, but has passed from death unto life, John 5, 24. It is just this confidence that is denied by the Roman system and by all gospels of works righteousness throughout history. Jesus declared, speaking of himself in the third person, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son. Stands condemned. The courtroom stands to hear his verdict. In fact, Jesus says in the next word, this is the verdict. In Acts 13, 39, we read through Christ. Everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified by the law of Moses. In Acts 15, 9, we're told he purified their hearts by faith. But we haven't even yet given our attention to the teachings of St. Paul, whose letters were originally especially written to oppose false gospels and confirm believers in the gospel of free grace. So I'll try to keep speaking quickly and get through them. Where is the addition of a loan necessary when Paul so clearly declares, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last? Is that not sola scriptura? If it is by faith from first to last, it is by faith alone. No one is righteous, says Paul. No, not even one. And this is especially interesting in the light of Vatican II's pronouncement that all who seek to obey God, even atheists, can be saved. Furthermore, like Jesus, Paul contrasts a righteousness that is by faith and a righteousness that is by works. He writes, but now a righteousness from God apart from law 
has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify the righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. In Romans 4, Paul reaches the heart of his argument, appealing to the example of Abraham. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, says Paul, a salary isn't a gift. The company owes it to you. Rome actually argues that we merit de congruo. Justification by our cooperation with grace. But merit is precisely what Paul is excluding here. He says, to the one who does not work. Forget ceremonial laws, any kind of laws, any kind of works. To the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked. His faith is credited as righteousness. In one fell swoop, all it took is one sentence, very clear sentence. Paul destroys every plank in the Roman doctrine of justification. Rome says justification is merited. Paul says it's a gift. Rome says it's given to those who work for it. Paul says it's given to those who especially do not work for it. Rome says God only justifies those who are truly holy inherently. Paul says God only justifies those who are truly wicked inherently. Rome says that justification is a process of attaining righteousness. Paul says justification is a declaration of imputed or credited righteousness. Furthermore, he cites David's example, Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. If we are justified by a process of cooperating with grace, we can only have peace with God when we cease to sin. But Paul writes, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Paul drives the point home further in verse 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? The latter half of Romans 5, Paul unpacks the legal, forensic character of justification that he's just defended. Adam's sin was imputed to the entire human race. We were made guilty before God, not by a process of sin being infused into us, but by a declaration of our solidarity with Adam as our representative head. In exactly the same way, we are justified. The judgment writes, Paul followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Are our opponents really willing to argue that condemnation is a moral process, not a legal verdict? Jesus said that he who does not believe stands condemned already, just as the one who believes has already passed from death unto life. Where is the process that leads to acquittal? From the mouth of our own Lord and his apostles, this justification is declarative. As a result, Paul confidently announces, there is therefore now, right now, not at the end if one cooperates with grace, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that the gospel, though foolishness to those who are perishing, is the wisdom and power of God because, he says, Christ has been made our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Here, Paul is simply picking up a recurring Old Testament gospel announcement. For instance, we read in Isaiah 61.10, and listen to these carefully. I delight greatly in the Lord, my soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me. Hark back to the lamb sacrificed for Adam and Eve, tearing off their fig leaves of self-righteousness, being clothed in the sacrificial lamb. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. External. Jeremiah prophesied of Christ, in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Not the Lord who infuses righteousness, the Lord who is my righteousness. But it is in Paul's letter to the Galatians where one finds the apostles' magisterial defense of the gospel in the crucible of controversy. 
Now, if a prominent church founded by the Apostle Paul could fall so quickly into a false gospel of works righteousness when the apostles were around and Paul founded the church, should we be terribly surprised at the confusion of the early church after the apostles died? Some of them said very good things. I can read some of their quotes about justification. Others said abominable things. Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ. Yes, it can be done quickly, very quickly. And are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. It's not good news. Evidently, says Paul, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven or a council, I did add that. We have that in our tradition, I guess should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Paul describes his public controversy with Peter, which would have been a rather remarkable thing had Peter been the first infallible pope. But Peter did in the end come around and in his own letters acknowledged Paul's writings as scripture. If Peter could be corrected by scripture, one could have hoped that those who claimed to be his successors might have imitated him. In fact, Peter himself declared that there is a heavenly inheritance reserved in heaven for those who through faith are shielded by God's power. And assures his readers, you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter opens his second epistle with a greeting to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. In Galatians, Paul declares that by the observing of law, no one will be justified. For if righteousness could be gained through law, Christ died for nothing. The apostle couldn't have been more aggravated. He says, you stupid Galatians! Who has bewitched you? All who rely on observing law are under a curse. Clearly, no one is justified before God by law because the righteous will live by faith. He didn't set works of love against the ceremonial works. He set faith against works of the law. The law is not based on faith. I'm still reading Paul. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, on the contrary, on the contrary. In Rome, one is justified by faith and obedience. But for Paul, justification by faith is contrary to justification by obedience. So Paul says the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. After having been freed from the bondage of legalism, he asks, How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. A famous passage in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, already cited, couldn't be clearer. It is by grace through faith, not of works. This parallels Paul's statement in Romans 11, because if it is by grace, it is not of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. They say it's by grace and works, but Paul says if it's by grace, it is not by works. To Timothy, the apostle writes, God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we, do, we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. He doesn't say not because we have followed the ceremonial law. He says not, be, not because of anything we have done, including love, including having a good relationship. By the way, if you think that the uh, law is difficult, just tell me I have to love God with everything I've got and my neighbor is myself. What I heard this morning doesn't make it at all It'd make me sleep any better at night. Our opponents will say that whenever Paul refers to works or law as contrary to faith, he is referring to the ceremonial law, but it is not because of anything that we have done. In the scriptures and throughout church history, proponents of this view have been charged with opening the door to loose living. It's the Apostle Paul himself who realized the full impact of his gospel when after announcing that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Very dangerous line. He anticipated his reader's shock. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Heaven forbid. This is his answer and ours. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? We don't deny regeneration or sanctification. We just don't happen to believe this is our acceptance before a holy God. We have to be accepted first. 
While the Apostle Paul knew that the gospel he preached would raise the objection that this would lead to loose living, Rome has never, I fear, had to worry about this accusation concerning the gospel she proclaims. Why would we hunger and thirst after righteousness if it's already imputed, some will ask. Because it's already imputed. It is similar to asking why a foster child would want to obey if he's already adopted. We're sons, not slaves. We serve God out of gratitude, not fear of judgment or hope of rewards. He can smell that a mile away. Tell me I have to sufficiently love God and my neighbor before I can enjoy God's favor, and I'll tell you the last thing I'll do. But tell me that he's already forgiven me, even of the sins I'm going to commit. Tell me he's already made me accepted in Christ because Christ is my righteousness. I want to serve him. I want to obey him. I want to love him. And I want to love my neighbor. In Protestant theology, salvation is a broad word. And the divide and conquer strategy won't work because we both acknowledge salvation is a broader word than justification, encompassing not only justification, but election, atonement, regeneration, sanctification, adoption, and final glorification. In these debates, a recurring error on the Roman side is to assume a false antithesis. Either the Bible teaches that justification and sanctification are one and the same thing, or the Bible teaches there's no such thing as sanctification. It's a false dilemma. This debate isn't over the question of whether God renews us and initiates a process of gradual growth and holiness. When they read those verses, we, don't, we have no problem with those passages. We are justified by faith alone, said Luther, but not by a faith that is alone. And this recurring affirmation of the new birth and sanctification as necessarily linked to justification leads one to wonder how caricatures continue to be perpetuated without foundation. This is why we don't find a problem with James, although Roman Catholics find great problems with the rest of Scripture on this subject. For Paul, speaking to new converts who have been steeped in legalism and paganism, the content of the gospel is uppermost. For James, addressing believers who gloried in what they called faith, but it was mere assent, he gives them a different uh, announcement. For Paul, the court of law is God's, and it is heavenly. For James, it is man's, and it is earthly. For Paul, the fact of justification is in view. For James, the proof of justification is his concern. So when James declared that faith is dead if it is alone, how could one object? We've just seen Luther's phrase, justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. And that's just what the people James uh, 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 was addressing uh, his letter to, uh, those people, uh, maintained. They could be justified by a faith that was alone. But a faith that works is not the same as justification by faith and works. Okay, to wind this up, is this doctrine fundamental to our faith? Isn't it simply a matter of fine-tuning things? After all, zeal is more important than knowledge, isn't it? We just love the Lord, seek to live the Christian life as long as we protest the right things together and vote the right way together and so forth. Isn't that the important thing? And yet Paul tells us that his fellow Israelites were zealous indeed, for I can bear witness of them, that they have a great zeal for God, but it is not according to knowledge. Knowledge of certain things is essential for, for salvation, says the Apostle, and the particular bit of knowledge Paul has in mind is the doctrine of justification by grace alone through faith alone. Since, now listen to this, weigh this carefully, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought instead to establish their own righteousness. They did not accept God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Today we will all be returning to our homes and many thoughts will fill our minds and hearts but the chief question must be, how can a holy God whose standard is absolute perfect holiness of heart, soul, mind and strength accept me, a sinful person, as his son or daughter? If God will not change his law to conform to your performance and you cannot change your performance to conform to God's perfect righteousness, it's a bit of a sticky wicket. <laughs>
In the Roman Requiem, Dies Irae, the believer is to sing, And what shall I say in my misery? Whom shall I ask to be my advocate? When scarcely the just may be without fear. In sharp contrast to this fear-driven piety that one sees in the Sistine Chapel, the scriptures offer another anthem for the believer's comfort, so well expressed by John Newton's hymn. Let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. He has brought us nigh to God. Let us wonder grace and justice join and point to mercy's store when by grace in Christ our trust is. Justice smiles and asks no more. He who washed us with his blood has secured our way to God. Yeah, let's, let's hold our applause again. Let me thank all of our opening. We need to take our seats, and we're now moving into the cross-examination period. Each side will have ten minutes to interrogate. The Protestants will lead us off, and Rod has the floor. You can, Rod, take the podium or sit in your seat, whichever you prefer, but I'll let you control the, the questioning. Would you respond to Dr. Ratzinger's words? We're finding it hard to understand Rome's position. You seem to disagree with one another, and all of you disagree with Ratzinger. Might might like to read the Ratzinger quote again if you need it. Would you like to uh, read that quote and give us enough context, please? Actually, if I can intervene on this one. Since we don't have the context and we don't have the time to deal with the context, I don't think it would be fair for the audience or for us to try to make a comment without having a chance to study that. Now, I will say that Cardinal Ratzinger is by no means a Protestant. After all, he is the head of the Sacred Congregation for the Faith. And that very office implies that he is entrusted with uh, the safeguarding of doctrine in the Catholic faith as it's taught around the world. Cardinal Ratzinger was also instrumental in the German Bishop's Catechism, which was issued in 1986, published by Ignatius Press. And if you wish to see how the German bishops dealt with the Protestant Reformation issue of justification by faith alone, and Cardinal Ratzinger's distinctive stamp on that work, I would recommend anybody interested, get that book read what the German bishop said about the Protestant Reformation and specifically justification by faith alone and I think it will become clear that Cardinal Ratzinger, neither Cardinal Ratzinger nor the German bishops nor the Catholic Church in general uh, will agree with some of the statements that were made by our opponents this, today. By the way, I wasn't arguing that Ratzinger was a Protestant. I was simply saying as a Roman Catholic uh, expert it is very curious that he said that salvation could only be sought outside the institution in Luther's time. Yeah, and I, I would look forward to studying that in, in more detail. And uh, maybe next time we do this, we can have a, a thought-out answer for that one. Well, and in any case, nobody doubts that the institution was in pretty terrible shape uh, in the uh, big, end, end of the uh, 14th and beginning of the 15th uh, and the 16th century. I mean, the thing was in very bad shape indeed, especially... If you had the ill luck to be in Erfurt, right? Not exactly a thriving metropolis. Erfurt was nevertheless visited upon by some of the worst theologians in the history of the church. It wasn't nearly as bad everywhere as it was in and around Erfurt. But it was bad plenty of places. And the Council of Trent is the first to admit it. Since much of the material on Luther, Calvin, and Norm, Norm Shepard well, were really guilty of the red herring fallacy that is committed when the argument diverts the attention of the listener by changing the subject to some other topic, uh, 
and the remark that not a book in the Bible separates works and faith except in Philemon is uh, guilty of the fallacy of suppressed evidence, that is, the requirement of true premises includes the proviso that the premises not ignore some important piece of evidence that outweighs the presented evidence. For instance, most dogs are friendly and pose no threat to people who pet them. Therefore, it would be safe to pet the little dog that is approaching us now. It might be a small pit bull. Would you care to rephrase that such that it's not guilty of the fallacy of suppressed evidence? Even in the book of Romans, in the first chapter, Paul talks about the obedience of faith. Our claim was that throughout the New Testament, faith is linked with obedience. Not that nowhere is faith contrasted with works. It's frequently contrasted, indeed, but with the works of the law. That is, contrasted with those works that come out of a project, a life project, of laying before God a perfect record. That's the, pro that's the self-righteous man's project. Of course, Paul contrasts faith with that. Since sanctification, you said, is part of our salvation, and good works is a necessary part of our sanctification, therefore good works is necessary for our salvation, could you restate that one and avoid the formal fallacy of the illicit major? Aha. Now, let's see. Where's my card here? Exactly how did I put it? I had... Wait a minute. You say I had an illicit major? Yes. Okay, let's hear that major again. Now I have to go through cards. Go ahead. <laughs> See, it seems well, your, to me... your quote you wanted to hear? Yeah. Okay. Since sanctification is part of our salvation... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just a moment. And... Uh, Good and works good works are, are a necessary in... part of sanctification, therefore good works is necessary, are necessary for our salvation. Yeah. Right. What's the problem? Where's the illicit premise? Well, sanctification is part of our salvation, is the major. You deny that? Yeah, let, I go through. let me add another, let me try another one while I'm looking. You can find the meaning of the biblical term works of law to the ceremonial law. No, How can you do this when the Decalogue forbids coveting we did not, internal we did action? Not, no, no, no. We said explicitly it covers the moral law as well. That's clear in Romans 2, 1 and 2. You can continue your question and then we'll answer it. Go ahead. How can you do this when the Decalogue forbids coveting and internal action and Jesus accepts love of God and love of neighbor, clearly internal, as summaries of the law? So if you remember in my little dissertation, I quoted Romans 7, verse 6, which refers to the written code that we are not to live by, but the law of the Spirit. And in that context, Paul talks about coveting in verse 8, which is the moral law. Therefore, the moral law fits under the rubric of the written code, just as in Romans 2.28, where he couples circumcision with the written code. Both of those, again, fall under the rubric that we had described. So your argument is we're no longer forbidden to covet? Our argument is what? So your argument is we're no longer forbidden to covet since we're no longer under the law? Did you say covenant? To covet. To covet. No, we're forbidden to covet. So we are obligated to the written law. If I come to Jesus like the rich man and said, I don't covet, I don't do this, I don't do that, but Jesus pierces my heart with a question, and I find that in my heart I can't give to the poor, then my heart is not right with God, no matter how much I claim to live by that moral law. It was a stick it in your face. I live by the law. Look how good I am, rich man, that Jesus was confronting. And Jesus exposed his fallacy. Would you say that living according to the spirit-given law of love makes this uh, not the same? same Wes what? Wesley argued that the law of love was reachable. That we could actually do with perfection, uh, though we couldn't obey the commandments, the written commandments. Would you agree? Well, I made the distinction between the law of the Spirit that intersects the Decalogue. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is the spirit of the law that he wants us to live by. Right. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. Okay. With grace given inside us. Yes. That's right. Okay. But not to perfection. But not to perfection. No, that's what God requires. Because no. we remain but he requires sinners. it. No, that's perfection. the major fallacy in your argument is that God requires perfect obedience after the atonement. 
before the atonement, of course. If we want to be justified by law, we would have to obey every law. That's why we can't be justified by law. So what about the passages that Mike quoted from Galatians that have to do with relating to him again in a contractual way by law? Then we're back into it in a different way? Yeah. If you're talking about Galatians 3, mm -hmm. do us bewitch you? See, they started out by the spirit of the law, not the works of the law. Then they were going back to the works of the law, just like the Hebrews were in the book of Hebrews. And what do we find in the book of Hebrews? They were falling away you know, from the faith. It's interesting. Paganism is defined by works of law like that. Would you tell me what exactly what the good news is? Is it that I have gas in the tank that I couldn't have otherwise to do the works that will save me? And there are two minutes for the good news. I, I was saying that scholars will sometimes say the essence of paganism this? is that. Can we answer this? Sure. Yeah, I'll tell you what the good news is. The good news is that prior to anything you and I ever received or did, there was an objective redemption. God sent his son into the world, born of a woman, <coughs> born under the law, right, to redeem those who were under the law. And that Son of God died not only for me and you, but for the whole world, as it says in 1 John. There is a universal, objective redemption. And in that universal, objective redemption, Christ died for us. For us. The objective redemption is not just a physical thing but through the mind of God accepting it and the mind of Christ accomplishing it, every one of us is reached as an intentional object. He died knowing you by name. And that is the basic imputation. That's where the imputational moment is. He died for all of us. And because His righteousness is imputed to every human being, in an intentional way. Grace is in the world. Grace is in the world. And the very first grace we receive is thanks to the fact that God is reckoning Christ's righteousness to us. Otherwise, why would he be giving us grace? I have a very brief question, if I might, to Mr. Sengenis. Do you believe that if a person dies in uh, mortal sin, he uh, cannot be saved? Yes, I do. Do you believe that to break the greatest, what Jesus calls the greatest commandment, is mortal sin? Yeah. The greatest commandment is So you love believe God, that if a neighbor. person does not perfectly love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and his neighbor as himself, he will be damned. There's your fallacy again. You said perfectly obey. God no, Jesus does not said that. require. Love perfect. God with all your heart, soul, mind, and yeah, strength. All the do you capacity, do that? all the capacity I have That's for what God's he says. grace, I will do. Okay? If I falter, God will forgive my sin. If I confess my mortal sin or my venial sin, whatever sin it is, God will forgive me. That's not That's even part and parcel with loving God. Having I will be forgiven for interrupting, and let me invite now the Roman Catholic <laughs> side to uh, begin its 10-minute cross-examination. You can do it from there or assume the podium. Anyone who would like to answer this can. How can you say that when one is justified by faith, it is only a declarative act of God and not an infused substantive change in the individual if you believe that the man who exercises justifying faith had to be regenerated internally to produce this faith. What is the difference between a regenerated person and a person infused with grace? I submit there is no general difference and that the Protestant effort that squeezes in a moment of declaratory, non-substantive change between regeneration and sanctification is incongruous and unbiblical. Well, first of all, if I might respond to this, that this uh, confuses the distinction between the logical uh, uh, cause, logical priority, and temporal uh, priority. When, when the Westminster Confession, for instance, says that regeneration precedes, it is in response to the Arminian uh, controversy that uh, faith is something generated by the sinner himself. Uh, what they mean there is that faith is granted. Faith is something that is given before the person has the ability to believe. But it is not on the basis of his regeneration that he is justified, as is the case in Rome. It is on the basis that the faith, uh, that it is on the basis that he has been regenerated, that he is given the faith which alone justifies. So it is necessary 
to have regeneration in the reformed system prior to the exercise of faith, but it is only, uh, but faith alone is the instrumental cause of our justification. It's just simply, you can't argue, it is, it is, it is a, a fallacy to argue that because it's logically prior, or uh, temporally prior, it is the cause. Uh, that's not the question I asked. I asked that if regeneration is an internal change in the person, and then sanctification is an internal change in the person, person, what in the Bible tells us of a suspension of this internal change for a declarative act of justification? What says it's the incongruous. Dec- How can you be regenerated and change and then not change for a moment in time to be justified by faith, and then you're changed again in sanctification. No, that's, that's the question. That's okay. That's not not uh, what we're arguing at all. What we're saying is the declaration has to come before the process begins. We're not denying the process whatsoever. We're simply saying that the person who is justified, as Paul said, is the man who is wicked. What what declaration comes before regeneration? What are you talking about? Hmm? What you said declaration comes before no, something. You before said regeneration. Sanctification. Okay, I'm talking about regeneration though. You're not answering my question. Regeneration is an internal change in the individual. That is before the declarative act of justification. You're saying to me that the declarative act of justification is not an infusion, is not an internal change. But you've already said he was changed just prior to his justification in regeneration. How can that be possible? Now, this does relate exactly to what I said the first time. Uh, I'll try to state it again. That be- because logical priority is not the same as temporal priority. It is not because I am regenerated that I am justified. It is because I am regenerated that I can exercise saving faith, which alone justifies. All right, I'm not going to beat a dead horse. I think the, you're confusing the terms by this logical and temporal. They, they are not uh, going to explain the issue, and I submit that you have an answer to the question. Well, I, then let me answer, because the point is, in justification, we are made right with God by the external and alien righteousness of Jesus Christ, not on the basis of what happens inside of me. Lots of things happen inside of me before I'm declared righteous. I breathe, I think, and I'm regenerated. But it is not on the basis of breathing or thinking or regeneration that I'm declared righteous. It is on the basis of the alien righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to me and received by faith. On an objective level, I can understand what you're saying. But you have said, on a subjective level, I am internally changed. I'm not breathing the Spirit. I have been given the Spirit in regenerations, objectively and subjectively. That's right, but I'm not basing my justification on that presence of the Spirit in me. That's not what justifies me. That's what, that's what John Calvin said. No, it is that not. My, that you misused only... and abused Calvin in the quotation from Ezekiel. You talk about not quoting in context. That was a, a flagrant misuse of what Calvin says and means. Well, that's and you should know that if you've read Calvin and studied him. That's not something new in Calvin. It's what Calvin says throughout his works. Well, and, gonna, and it's perfectly clear that I, he says we are justified by faith alone. There is no difference between the Reformed and Lutheran on that point. Well, uh, that verse was used by Richard Gaffin to support Norman Shepard. I know you were on the other side of that issue. I'm only using what he used. I'm talking now about the Reformed confessional statements. I don't... Right. Uh, it is indeed a red herring to get off into these, uh, into these we'll, questions. We're going to move on. We'll talk about it later. Uh, oh, last night, Bob, you called me a fundamentalist. Today, Mike called us Pharisees. Now, Same thing. Since, since you're so fond of uh, the glory of logical fallacies and uh, pointing out these alleged fallacies, uh, then I would charge you all with the fallacy of ad hominem argument by trying to Uh, diminish the credibility of the Catholic side by referring to them in those pejorative terms. I'd like to know whether the man who said these words would be, under your rubric, either a fundamentalist or a Pharisee, given the fact that he is saying what we're saying. He says, quote, We do insist that the Holy Spirit unites the regenerate soul with Christ and produces faith and all virtues along with it forever, which is the very substance of infused grace. He further says, justification does not refer to the state of man, but it does not exclude it. If nothing were done to the man, in, in, then in brackets here, in justification, which is what he's referring to, God would not look at him as justified. And another person said much the same thing. He said, the regeneration that precedes and engenders saving faith does affect a real change in the person who is justified, though that change is by no means the ground of justification. These two men were John Gerstner and R.C. Sproul. 
men whom you know. Uh, what they said, we agree with wholeheartedly. You seem to disagree strenuously with this. No, the key line there is, uh, he said, uh, that these things are not the ground of justification. That's what right. we've been arguing. And we say And we same. agree. The Council of Trent, which we quoted earlier, said exactly the same thing. Yes, but they're the using invasion. ground differently than you're using the word ground. You're using ground as meritorious cause. That's not the way they're using ground. Let, let, let me rephrase because this. Because they're then. excluding the formal causation that Trent teaches. Do you right. agree with his phrase, it is the very substance of infused grace? Yes, I have no trouble with Oh, that. so you have no problem with infused grace? No, not of course not. The Westminster, can, the Westminster Larger Catechism, if you're familiar with it, in question 77, says that indeed we are sanctified by infused grace. We as Protestants have never Wait denied that justified. God does yeah. indeed says, infuse grace into his people. He says justification does not refer to the state of man, but it does not exclude it. If nothing were done to the man, that involves a change in the man, in justification. You said sanctification. Yes, so I did. Okay, Gerstner is speaking about no, justification no, 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 no. and an intrinsic change to the man. You're wrong. He's not referring to justification. He's referring to regeneration. He is simply saying that the, that the person who is changed, uh, the, the, per, the justified person is changed, no question about it. But it is not on that basis that he is justified. That is simply all that we're arguing. God does infuse grace into us. God does change us. God does renew us. In, in, in all of those but things, it's not right, we agree. In all those things, we agree. I think that the key point is this: that the Catholic position is that when God says you are justified, you are justified by the power of His grace. The Catholic position believes that God's grace, that. God's grace, is more powerful than my sin. Yeah, and that's that the is the position that gives the greater glory to God. Two minutes remain in, in the cross examination. One last question, I would suggest. <clears throat> Can I get one in for uh, Michael Horton? I, I hope that a lot of people will appreciate hearing an answer to this. Because towards the end of your remarks, you were going pretty fast. And you said two things, uh, you know, within about three or four sentences of each other. And I'll be darned if I can see how to put them together. So I want you to reconcile them for me. First, you said that faith excludes all human activity. Then you said that faith works by love. Mm -hmm. How can those two claims both be true? No, faith faith uh, is, is the... It, it, we are justified by faith excluding all other human activity, but the faith that justifies is working. It does not justify by its working, but the very moment a person believes that very same faith goes to work with sanctification. It immediately begins to produce good works. I think everybody will agree that what this debate really needs is a good critique of prepositions and relations. The by, the through, the basis, I mean, what we have here is failure to communicate. <laughs> Let me thank our cross-examiners. And now we move into the rebuttal mode, ten minutes each side, and I invite the Roman Catholic side to rebut. Mr. Horton quoted Fitzmaier and Brown as contrary doctrines to the Catholic Church. But this is the glory of the Roman Catholic Church. They can even have an imprimatur on a book, and that book can even teach heresy. But the deposit of faith is in Rome, and it has never changed. And Mr. Fitzmaier and Mr. Brown don't speak all the time for the Catholic Church. We have a guide, we have a rule to judge whoever speaks for the Catholic Church, even me, even Pat and Bill, especially us. He said that there was no courtroom, I mean, I said there was no courtroom scene in the Bible. He claims that there is. He claims that there's this, some legal context. I would like to know where that is. I know where they think it is. In Romans 8, verse 33, Paul says, who shall lay a charge to God's elect? If God justifies, who shall condemn? But if you look at the context of Romans chapter 8, there is no legal context there. There is no courtroom scene there. First of all, let's examine the phrase in Romans 8.33. A charge. Does it have to be in a courtroom? No. We just heard the story about the Pharisee and the publican. What did the Pharisee do to the publican? 
He charged him. He said, that man is not righteous. I am righteous. That's a charge. That man is a sinner. I'm not a sinner. That's a charge. And what did Jesus say? Well, the publican, the tax collector, he went home justified. Why? Because of Romans 8.33. Because no man that God justifies will be condemned. But that's not in a courtroom scene. In the chapter of Romans 8, all that we are surrounded by are familial relational terms. Verse 14, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. I don't cry, Judge, equip me. I cry, Abba, Father. And I am an heir, it says in verse 17. A joint heir with Christ. Christ, it says, intercedes for us. In verse 34. It also says in verse 23, the Spirit intercedes for us with a cry of adoption. Christ is not interceding in a court of law. He's interceding with the Spirit in adoption. What is adoption? That's a family relationship. There is no context here of juridical, legal, forensic atmosphere. Romans 5.1, another passage they point to. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace. We now stand. Amen. Well, let's read in verse 5. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. This is part of the justification context. So we have faith, hope, and love in a justification context. And that is exactly what we said. That faith, hope, and love are the criterion by which justification occurs. And then it's sandwiched again in verse 10. You shall be saved. And it already talked about hope and love. Romans 5.16 was, or 5.15 was brought up as supporting juridical justification, saying that our sins from Adam were imputed. But look at verse 16. It says, again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Many, not one trespass, not just Adam's trespass, my trespass. As I live my Christian life, I trespass a lot. But that is part of my justification that I'm justified from. You see, it's more than just this one-time imputative act. It is an ongoing continuum that I am justified from my many sins, not from one sin. Mr. Horton quoted from Philippians 3.9 when Paul talks about I counted everything as dung. What did he count as dung? I made the point earlier. In verse 6 of that same chapter, Paul says, I live like a Pharisee. Well, who was the typical example of the Pharisee in Luke 18? I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my goods. That's what Paul lived like. That kind of righteousness will not stand in God's face. That proud, boasting righteousness that Paul condemns now. He says that Jesus taught faith alone everywhere. Read Matthew 25. Jesus says, I was hungry and I was thirsty. I was naked. And they say, what did we see you that way, Lord? The least of my brethren. When you did it to them, you did it to me. And then he will say to the righteous, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Is that faith alone? I dare say not. I noticed that in his opening remarks, he strenuously avoided referring to the judgment of works at the end of time. Not one reference to them. I would avoid them, too, if I was in his position, because they speak very poignantly to what will happen. He did point to John 5:24 that says there is no condemnation 
Right? That's right. Who, those who believe will not be condemned. They will not face the condemnation in hell. That's granted. It doesn't say they're not going to be standing before God. That's the way that verse was interpreted. But that's not what it means, because in the very same verse, it says there will be those who will have this judgment and they will be condemned to hell. In Isaiah, he said, Isaiah says that he clothed me with righteousness. But in the Psalms, David says he washed me. He cleansed me. He didn't just cover me. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 32, where it says he covered my sins, in the very next verse, it says that he has no deceit in his spirit. In Psalm 106, 31, Phineas is declared righteous by his works. Look that up in your Bible. Psalm 106, verse 31. In Psalm 18, verse 20 to 24, Psalm 7, verse 8, Psalm 26, verse 1, David says, His righteousness has made him justified before God. Yes, there are times that David talks about God's righteousness, and I thank God that he doesn't count me for my sins. Amen. Because God forgives me of my sins. But that doesn't negate the fact that David talked about his righteousness. Mr. Horton said faith was contrary to obedience. Bill so eloquently told us of Romans 1, verse 5, and Romans 16, verse 25, that talked about the obedience of faith. I think that speaks well of obedience and faith. He said, faith does not include love. He says, I'll tell you one thing, that's the last thing I'll do if I'm told to love. If I have to love. What does Paul say in Galatians 5, 6? Faith working through love. What does Jesus say in Matthew 22, 37? The greatest commandments. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13? That you can have all the faith in the world to move mountains, but if you have not love, you're a clanging symbol. You mean to tell me after all that buildup of love, that is not going to be the major criterion by which God judges us? You mean that's just words? Love has nothing to do with it? I dare say that's why I think that view is heretical. In James chapter 2, the argument is raised. How much time? The argument was raised. It, well, there actually were no arguments raised for James chapter 2, and I'm astounded at that. No significant arguments. In Romans, or James chapter 2, verse 13, James talks about the judgment. And he talks about what can save me. It's a salvation context. It's not a demonstration before men. It's not something other than what Paul talks about. It's a justification for salvation. And James says, this does not come by faith alone. It comes by works. And someone will say to me, but that's before man, you see. Who, pray tell, was there when Abraham was sacrificing Isaac on Mount Moriah? There were no men there. There was only God and the angel witnessing Abraham's obedience. It was not before men. It was before God. The same justifying faith that was before God that Paul spoke of. And now the, the ten minute Protestant rebuttal. We've been discussing this absolutely crucial matter of how we are made right with God, and we are defending as Protestants what we believe to be the clear teaching of Scripture that we are made right with God by grace alone through faith alone. And Mr. Marshner began with an eloquent plea that we not misrepresent the position of Rome uh, as uh, not teaching salvation by grace, and I don't want to do that. Uh, but I think it is important to say at the outset that the Council of Trent did not teach salvation by grace alone. And the great Cardinal Contarini, a member of that council, pled with the Pope not to promulgate the decrees of the Council of Trent because he knew that if those decrees were promulgated, they would confirm Rome in a semi-Pelagian position. They were promulgated. They are the official teaching of Rome, and Rome is officially semi-Pelagian. It's not 
the most extreme form of semi-Pelagianism that had been tolerated in the Middle Ages, but it is a form of semi-Pelagianism. The Roman Church rejected Augustine's teaching that salvation is by grace alone. And Canon 4 on justification of the Council of Trent says, If anyone saith that man's free will, moved and excited by God, by ascending to God, exciting and calling, nowise cooperates towards disposing and preparing itself for obtaining the grace of justification, and skipping a few words for the sake of time, let him be anathema. That's Robes' position. You must use your free will to cooperate with grace. That's what it says there. They may not like it, but there it is. That's the deposit of faith that Rome would defend. But it's not what the scripture teaches. Now, we've had a lot of confusion. Uh, Mr. Marshner began with a, with a number of very helpful and clear distinctions. But in the later discussion... We found time and time again salvation as a broad concept being confused with justification as a narrow concept. We insist that there needs to be a clear distinction between justification and sanctification in the understanding of the whole of salvation. And that distinction is necessary to take account of the biblical evidence which Mr. Horton has so marvelously marshaled for us today. And the reason that distinction needs to be made clear is that Scripture makes clear that on the one hand, we are perfectly right with God, and on the other hand, we are still very imperfect. Now, how do we take account of that? Well, the teaching of Scripture, as Mr. Horton uh, pointed out, um, takes account of that by saying, in Christ's perfect righteousness, we are justified and therefore made perfectly right with God. And in God's internal renewal of us, in his uh, infusing grace in us by the Holy Spirit, we are progressively sanctified and conformed more and more to the image of Christ throughout our life. And God will vindicate on the last day his salvation, both in justification and in sanctification, by displaying before the world that his justified ones were in fact sanctified in the course of their life and that they did good works. That will be displayed on the last day. That's the judgment of works. And that explains why David in Psalm 26 can say, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I've led a blameless life. Now, if you read that in context, you see that's in relation to the wicked who oppose God and hate God at every point. But David can also say in Psalm 43, verse 6, Enter not into judgment with thy servant, Lord, for in thy sight no man living is righteous. It is not the grossly ungodly that David's talking about as unrighteous. He's talking about himself when he stands before God, when he contemplates the full perfection of God's holiness. All he can cry out is, don't enter into judgment with me, Lord, for even me as your servant, even me as the man after your own heart, I am not righteous. I cannot stand in the judgment before your holiness. I need a perfect righteousness to be declared right with you. And that perfect righteousness can be found only in your son. Only in your son. Now, Mr. Sejanus quoted and made a good deal of uh, Acts 10 and uh, Cornelius. It's interesting that the subject of justification narrowly considered doesn't appear in Acts 10 at all. But it is also interesting that Mr. Sejanus does not quote uh, this statement of uh, Peter. Uh, all the prophets testified about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That's the message that Peter bore to Cornelius as well as to others. Forgiveness is through believing in the name. That is being connected with the work and the person of Jesus Christ. That's our passion. That's our concern. Mr. Marshall was asked, what is the good news? And he responded by saying, the good news is that there's imputation of righteousness for every creature in the world. Does Mr. Marshner then hold, as many Roman Catholics today to do, that every creature in the world will go to heaven? I'm glad he's shaking his head no, because that's clearly not the teaching of Scripture. It's not the teaching of the tradition of the church, although it is the teaching of certainly a majority, it seems, of theologians of the Roman church in America today. Let me withdraw a majority. It may not be a majority, but certainly a large number But you see, unless he's willing to say that this imputation everyone all around the world leads everyone to heaven, we still don't know what the good news is for you. 
The question is, how do you know that there is good news from God for you? And the answer, of course, is to be found in what Peter says to Cornelius. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, in who he is, in what he's done, if you rely upon him, then you will be saved. You see, the publican, as he stood before God, did not say, Lord, be merciful to me, a former sinner who has now been regenerated and significantly renewed and by the Spirit now fulfills the law of the Spirit in, in a way that I do not boast but nonetheless recognize the fruits of your grace in my life so that I really can come before you and say, you have done a wonderful work in making me new, so justify me. No, he says, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Now, a lot of words have been thrown in the face of Martin Luther. I'm not here to defend every word of Martin Luther. He was not infallible. He never removed James from the canon in any printed version. We need to, to, to bear that in mind. But Martin Luther captures the exact sense of the prayer of the publican when he says, what do we have to offer to God? And the answer is, nothing but our sins. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he went down justified. That's what our Lord teaches. That's what the scripture as a whole teaches. The work of Jesus Christ is about justifying sinners of whom even David and Abraham and Paul are chief. And the reason that this difference between us is absolutely central to eternal life and to this life and to all spirituality is that if you will be right with God only as you adequately confess your sins, only as you adequately walk by the law of the Spirit, only as you merge justification and sanctification together, then you must spend your spiritual life in constant introspection to see how you're doing. That is Roman piety. That is historic Roman piety. The faithful Roman Catholic is the one who does go regularly to the sacrament of penance, who is constantly examining the self. But the glory of the good news is we are called to look away from ourselves, from our failures, from our sins, to the perfection of Jesus Christ on the cross and in his perfect life for our righteousness. That's why we don't boast because we're not pleading anything of our own. We're pleading Christ on the cross and in his perfect life for the perfection of our righteousness. And so I plead with you. Don't rest in anything that you've accomplished. However much you may want to attribute it to the grace of God. God, if you are his own, is doing gracious things in you to sanctify you. And he will display that gracious work of his before the world in the last day. But he says to you today, you may say with Paul, as he has written in Romans 8, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That doesn't wait till the last day. It's true now. And that word condemnation is a legal term. Uh, Mr. Segetis did not answer at any point the numerous references to the legal character of the teaching of justification that uh, Mr. Horton finds in Scripture and that also the Roman Catholic Encyclop Encyclopedia Sacramentum Mundi finds in Scripture. We heard no answer to any of that. Forensic categories are replete in the Scripture, and they are crucial because the good news is the matter is settled now to everyone who looks away from self and looks to Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's the gospel that the apostle brought. It's the gospel I commend to you. Hold your applause, please. I invite you again to hold your applause to the end. Hold your... Let me go ahead and begin the question and answer session. I'm going to take the liberty of myself asking the first question. And I announced last night my Anglican commitment to the Via Media. Here I will announce my Arminian commitment, which in this company may make me a heretic from both sides of the aisle. But I do have a question for both sides, and it's a question that has two parts. The first part is about the how of justification by faith, justification by faith alone.
And what I have in mind is, is this. How does the grace requisite for justification and perhaps also sanctification work? Is it resistible or is it irresistible? And in particular, what I want to tease out is the possibility that monergism and synergism is something of a false either or, meaning the question either God does it all irresistibly or we somehow cooperate meritoriously. For Arminius, as many of you may know, I think the answer is something like this, and it's meant to be neither Pelagian nor semi-Pelagian, meaning we don't do it on our own, neither do we even begin the process freely to turn to God, and then God completes it, that would be semi-Pelagian. But there is a moment of freedom where we can say yes or no to the indispensable offer of God's grace. If that's not so, then God is responsible for evil because God does it all irresistibly without any kind of canonic respect for human freedom. And the question then is how does grace work with respect to justification by faith? Do we have the liberty to refuse the offer of grace either for justification or for sanctification? I say, well, we would not only say that we have the liberty to refuse, we would say that we have the uh, there's no question that we will refuse because Paul says we're dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus said no man can even come to me unless I draw him or, or also in another verse unless it is granted of the father. So Paul says it does not depend on man's decision or effort, but on God's mercy. Even that is God given faith. And rather than focusing on irresistible grace, uh, I think we should focus on total depravity. The real issue here is can a person have a moment of free will. And we would argue that uh, the only the first time he has free will, the first time he has the liberty to choose what he used to hate is when uh, Jesus Christ calls out Lazarus come forth. And I think we'd all agree with the 39 articles of the Church of England on that point. <laughs> In any case, but those are Arminian articles. Uh, uh, not thanks, Arminian articles. Thanks for the question, because it brings up an important clarification. Um, Professor Godfrey has a hidden agenda, and our moderator has brought it out. He claims that Trent did not teach salvation by grace alone, and the only evidence he cites is Canon 4, and the only relevant part of the canon to substantiate the case is the phrase, cooperating with grace. Uh -huh. Also now, the phrase, behind, free will. Behind the claim <clears throat> that the talk of cooperation with grace is semi-Pelagian, is the claim, which is a purely Calvinist claim, that gratia is always operans and never becomes at any point cooperans. All right? This is the claim that grace muscles you over and in no sense ever restores your faculty to life. If grace is restoring your will and your heart to life, then at that very point, the restored faculty is beginning to operate and gratia becomes cooperans. Now, that point has been insisted upon by the church since the Council of Arles in 473. The demand that, that um, human obedience uh, goes along, human response goes along with the grace of God is in the <clears throat> insisted on in the canon of Arles and uh, from 473 and so this is no novelty in the church and it's interesting you should if you get a chance look up that council because it was dealing with a priest named Lucidus he was a Gaul but he was Calvin a thousand years early um, among his other condemned propositions were that in man's fall, his free will became totally extinct. Extinct, not weakened, extinct. And his proposition that Christ, the Lord and Savior, did not die for all. That, let me, Limited let me, atonement, let me, irresistible grace. It's all condemned in 473. Let me, let me pick up on, on the second theme. That's the second half of the question I wanted to ask, if you indulge me a little Further. And I think this one really is quite, quite profound, weighty, important, difficult. And it is that question of 
what do we mean by justification by faith in terms of to whom it applies? The first question was a how question, how does grace work? The second question is to whom is the grace extended? Did Christ die for all? And I would ask both parties, again, is justification by faith alone only extended to the elect such that some could not, even in principle, say yes to grace in that they are necessarily reprobated by virtue of not being offered the grace. The question then is about limited atonement. Are there only in principle some who could receive this grace or is it open to all? Mr. Moderator, that's a fascinating question and I have no hidden agenda about my Calvinism. My Calvinism is right out front and I embrace it enthusiastically because it's what the scripture taught and the church only departed from it around 473 according to Mr. Marshall. The purpose, the purpose of quoting from Canon 4 of the Council of Trent is not that it just says, talks about cooperation with gr grace, it talks about free will cooperating with grace, which is specifically what uh, Augustine denies. Now, our friends always assume that when we deny free will, we're, we're, we're denying a will. We don't deny that man has a will. No Calvinist has ever denied man has a will and that he uses his will and acts by his will. The question is whether the will is free before God acts to change the will to choose for God. And that Augustine absolutely, categorically, certainly denied in his mature thought. He retracted his earlier statements about uh, the freedom of the will, although uh, many in the Middle Ages uh, continued to quote him on that point. Now, if we wanted to have a long discussion and, and conference on the extent of the atonement, I think that would be marvelous and helpful. We would have differences as Protestants about that, but as Protestants, we have always insisted that that difference on the extent of the atonement does not disunite our common conviction about justification by faith alone. And if we want to take a half an hour or an hour to talk about the extent of the atonement, I will be glad to do that, but I do not see that uh, uh, our differences as Protestants on that point um, uh, certainly between Lutheran and Reformed, uh, at all bear on our common confession that we are justified by faith alone. Very quickly, too, to, to respond, it's not just as if the, it was all condemned in 473, because I'm sure you're familiar with the Council of Orange in 429, 52. which said that, if, I'm sorry, 529, which said that if anyone believes that he's, uh, that uh, justification, uh, that uh, uh, conversion comes as a result of uh, our cooperation with grace and the saying of a prayer, let him be anathema. Response? Two responses. Let, let me start just by a, a brief uh, corrective for Bob here. First of all, you're referring to Augustine's retractationes, which is not translated as retractions. Uh, retractationes is a Latin word which means a rethinking of certain things, and actually he was uh, dealing in more depth with the Pelagian heresy in retractationes. He was not retracting certain things that he had said later. That's a misuse of the Latin term. Now, I, I would draw your attention to that precisely because when Augustine was dealing with this issue with Pelagius, he was drawing out even deeper conclusions that he had not done before. But he was not saying, I now disagree with something that I said earlier. Augustine did champion free will, as you know. He did not deny that in Retractationes. He simply brought out the fact that man's free will was wounded by the fall. And it was so gravely wounded that it's very difficult for man to respond to the gospel. And it's impossible for someone to respond to the gospel without the grace of God acting upon his will. And that is the clear picture of what Augustine said. And I would invite you to read retractationes if you would like to see what he said. Furthermore, if the will cannot respond apart from grace, that's what we mean by not having no, a free will. So will, maybe this is just a semantic difference. Well, that. perhaps it is, but I just want to, be, I want to make sure that we don't misrepresent what Augustine in fact said. Uh, the other thing I would like to say just by way of, um, just to clarify the issue, uh, Bob, you said that the Bible teaches Calvinism. Mm -hmm. I yes, that's love what I believe. That's why I'm a Calvinist. I wouldn't be a Calvinist if I didn't I believe the Bible taught so, it. I would so, but I would love to see Rod affirm that. Uh, I would love to know if Rod believes that the Bible teaches Calvinism. <laughs> now, if he doesn't, then we have still the same problem that we discussed last night. Um, I believe that the Calvinists have to add to Scripture. When I was a Calvinist, uh, I remember in a Bible study... Uh, I quoted 1 Timothy 2.4, which says, God desires all men to be saved. And the pastor of the church, an OPC church, he said to me, yeah, but that means the elect. God desires all the elect to be saved. I go, but where is that in the verse? Oh, but it's implied in there. Oh, I see. And what about 2 Peter 3.9? God is not willing that any should perish. But that refers to the elect, he says. But where is that in the verse? 
It's implied. Oh, I see. Acts 17, verse 30. God calls all men everywhere to repentance. Now, Mr. Horton, is, are you going to tell me that God is asking me to do something? Begging me? Pleading with me? It says, I am here everywhere. I am in and out of your being. I want you to repent to me repent of your sins, but you don't have the ability to do it. Come to me, but you don't have the ability to do it. That is an absurd logical proposition. He gave the, uh, the example of Lazarus rising from the dead. I used to use that all the time too. Dead in my sins. Now I use the prodigal son. What did he do? He came to his senses and walked back to his father and his father received him with open and loving arms. How did he do it? By the grace of God, of course, but he wasn't dead. That's a metaphor. And that metaphor is taken out of its context. It's stretched to its limit. I, I submit that the Bible talks about both. None of us here is going to solve the problem of uh, predestination and free will. Uh, Tim, I need to add one, one thing to that, if you will please uh, let me. Lest anybody misunderstand what, we, what is being said here tonight or this morning, the Catholic Church in no way says that man has a native ability to respond to God. That is only a gift of God's grace. There's nothing in man that can merit that. And I would just quote Trent again to make sure everybody is clear on this. To come to the fellowship, I'm, I'm starting halfway through the passage, it's quite long. And to come to the fellowship of his sons, and we are therefore said to be justified gratuitously, because none of those things that precede justification, whether faith or works, can merit the grace of justification. For if by grace it is not now by works, otherwise, as the Apostle Paul says, grace is no more grace. So when the Catholic Church speaks about man responding, it's because of God's grace in him that allows him to respond, not because of any native talent. That is Pelagianism. Okay. Let me now turn to the questions from the audience itself. And we have first for the Protestant side, specifically for Michael Horton, if we believe in... Imputed righteousness. Is there ever a point at which righteousness becomes infused to the believer? Thank you. Infused is, uh, I mean, I think a poor choice of words. It's not that I don't believe in infusion, in sanctification, but I think it's a poor choice of words. To speak of uh, the righteousness of Christ being imparted in sanctification rests uh, on the notion of union with Christ, and this is something that we should definitely uh, bring up in answer to this question. At the heart of Calvin's doctrine of, uh, well, of, of his entire theology is this notion of union with Christ. Through faith alone, we are united to Christ and receive all of his benefits. Now, his benefits are justification, his perfect righteousness imputed to us, but also uh, everything else, regeneration, uh, sanctification, redemption, all of the things that are included in uh, our salvation come from Christ. It is union with Christ that holds justification and sanctification together so that you never have a person who is justified but not being sanctified. Everything, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 1, that in Christ we have all heavenly blessings uh, in, uh, uh, or spiritual blessings in heavenly places in him. So that uh, uh, really there is there what what we have been caricatured as saying today is that we are opposing faith to obedience. We're not any more than we're opposing justification to sanctification. What we are opposing is justification by faith to justification by obedience. Okay. Thank you. And let me now ask a question for the Roman Catholics. It reads, did Abraham lose his justification when he fornicated in the tent with Hagar? How about when he lied about Sarah being his wife? Also, who was his confessor to help him clean up after these messes? You know, it's funny. In uh, Romans chapter 4, it talks about Abraham being saved by faith, not works. And then it quotes David in the Psalms. David says, I thank God that he's forgiven my sins, which implies that Abraham had sins. Yes, he did sin. That's the whole point of our discussion. But he was forgiven of those sins as he confessed to God. There was no man that didn't have sin. Abraham was no exception to the rule. If Abraham continued to sin, as the Bible speaks of people continuing to sin and falling away, yes, he would have lost his justification. But the Bible also speaks of continuing to be justified by continuing to repent of our sins. And he maintained his justification in that way. 
We by no means say that Abraham did not sin. Okay. One last very quick question addressed to both sides in reference to Genesis 38, 9, and 10. If in Genesis the seed that Onan spilled upon the ground kept from childbirth from his brother's wife and therefore the Lord slew him for a detestable thing, isn't it also a detestable thing for a man to use a condom or any birth control device and a woman from being impregnated and in the danger of the wrath of God? Yes. In theory, that's addressed to both. But. Okay. Um, you know, if you look at that context, he was not... This is, this is why the Catholic... Well, we're getting on a subject that's not germane to our topic here. That's but, right. Um, I... I <laughs> Could you pick why why are we clapping? Could you pick a different question? Well, I, I can't, in fact, pick a different question. We don't have any more time. So maybe that's okay. appropriate. Let that one go. Now, whoever asked that question, by the way, please see me in the back. I'd love to answer that for you.